We designed Aerodinosaur as a one-stop, informative, and experience-centric channel covering heavy piston-powered commercial prop liners that represented the state of the art for the 1930s into the early 1960s, as well as military aircraft powered by variants of the same engines. In most of our videos, we also feature rare, inside and out, full audio footage of operations of the few remaining aircraft in these categories up to this day. In the future, vintage prop liner contemporaries such as the Lockheed L-188 Electra may be considered as subjects for this channel. When on our channel homepage, please click on videos from the choices at the top to see the full range of our video offerings. Also, if you click on playlists on that same bar, you will find in one place our library of quality prop liner and heavy piston videos from other YouTube creators. And of course, don't forget the subscribe button. We'd also like to mention our video series here on Aerodinosaur Channel we call The Poor Man's Hangar Tour. In this series, we delve into the power evolution of U.S. heavy radial power plants and the aircraft they powered from the 1930s through the so-called overdevelopment of engines and airframes in the 1950s before the dawn of the jet age. We start with the earliest lower powered engines and move forward in time to the last high powered variants of the same engines used decades later. Since we're too poor to own any airplanes or hangars, we resort to utilizing our lifetime scale replica collection as a starting point for each discussion. The models as presented will be liberally complemented with photographs and video footage of the actual engines and aircraft under discussion, making this truly an experience-centric poor man's hangar tour. We'll also compare the big radials to competing liquid-cooled V-12 engines of the period, including Rolls-Royce, Daimler-Benz, and Allison engines, and the big Bristol radials out of the UK. In doing this, we quickly find our discussions cannot be limited to any single aircraft category, such as military versus commercial, or fighters versus prop liners. All are intertwined in this evolution and cannot be separated. The earliest monster radial engines typically started life in military fighters, bombers, and transports, and with continuous improvement and evolution over the two decades, found their way into commercial airliners and their military transport and surveillance counterparts as a stopgap for jet age technology. We hope you enjoy our different perspective on the piston aero engines and aircraft of the mid 20th century, and we look forward to bringing this to life for you. In our last episode three of the Poor Man's Hangar Tour series, we covered the very first definitive two-row radial engine, which emerged in the early 1930s. This was the 14-cylinder Pratt & Whitney R1830 Twin Wasp. We reviewed its evolution up to its most common 1,200 horsepower variant as found in the Douglas DC-3 and C-47 transports and the consolidated B-24 Liberator Strategic Bomber of World War II. After most major passenger airlines retired their DC-3s in the mid-1960s, most DC-3s were relegated to freight operations. As mentioned, the DC-3 was operated by these second and third tier airlines and militaries worldwide into the new millennium, and a handful remain in civilian revenue service today. As we mentioned in our earlier Poor Man's Hangar Tour video, the DC-3 had limited range in the short and medium range categories and could carry up to 28 passengers or a 6,000 pound freight payload. Hi, John Reed, Aerodinosaur. Today we're going to look at a successful follow-on engine by Pratt & Whitney that upped the takeoff horsepower from 1,200 horsepower to 1,450 horsepower. This was the R2000 Twin Wasp D, which we will dissect in this episode.
The Twin Wasp D was little more than an upscaled R1830 Twin Wasp. The major difference being the slightly larger cylinders of increased bore, changing the bore and stroke from 5.5 by 5.5 inches to 5.75 by 5.5 inches. Thus, the R2000 was an unusual short stroke and not a square configuration. In the short stroke engine, the piston stroke is actually shorter than the cylinder bore, which is unusual for radial engines. However, first there was a slightly larger experimental interim engine with an extended 6 inch stroke that briefly appeared just before the R2000, which we'll cover in a moment. The R2000 powered only two mainstream large transport aircraft. The four-engine Douglas DC-4 commercial airliner and its C-54 military transport counterpart, and the twin-engine de Havilland DHC-4 Caribou military assault transport. This engine was not used in military fighters and bombers like the smaller R-1830. The R-2000 was also used on a very limited basis in some DC-3 military variants, but otherwise, all other applications besides the DC-4 and Caribou were very limited experimental and non-production aircraft. Like most transport radials, it had a single-stage, two-speed geared internal supercharger. So how and why did the R2000 come about? As we discussed in the previous episode 3, it had to do with the high cost of high octane fuels being developed during the 1930s. The airframe manufacturers wanted 1,200 horsepower out of the new R1830 twin WASP engine that powered the DC-3 and B-24, but with widely available and moderately priced 87 octane aviation gas, barely 1,000 horsepower could be eked out of its 14 cylinders. It would require a very expensive 100 octane fuel to achieve the 1,200 horsepower goal. However, initially scaling up the R1830 cylinders from a bore and stroke of 5.5 by 5.5 inches to 5.75 by 6 inches to give the engine more cubic inch capacity would allow for 1,200 horsepower or more on 87 octane gas. So that is what was done, resulting in the extremely short-lived R2180 Twin Hornet engine. It was mounted on the Douglas DC-4 prototype, the ungainly DC-4E, which was basically a drastically upscaled, doubled-up capacity DC-3 with four engines and a triple tail, which appeared in June 1938. It did have some technical advances over the DC-3, mainly centering on passenger convenience and comfort. However, the airlines felt it was too large and complicated for existing markets, so the single prototype was sold to Japan. Despite that, the concept of the Douglas DC-4E resulted from the constant demand from the airlines for true long-range, larger passenger capacity airliners. The goal was to build true, efficient, ocean-spanning intercontinental land plane fleets Shoes that the current state-of-the-art DC-3 and even the four-engine Martin and Boeing Clipper seaplanes could not fill in during the mid-1930s as they were all very slow, lacked the desired range and capacity, and as seaplanes, which were standard for long-range transport at the time, were limited by water operations only. The scaled-back plane became the definitive and more practical DC-4 land plane, and to power the revised plane, the R-2180 Twin Hornet was likewise scaled back slightly to become the R-2000 Twin Wasp D, which could soon develop 1,300 horsepower on 87 octane fuel. However, as 100 octane fuel production was ramped up, its price fell closer to 87 and 90 octane, eventually allowing the R2000 to develop 1,350 horsepower on 100 octane, then 1,450 horsepower on the DC-4 with 100-130 performance number avgas, which was the so-called sweet spot for this revised airplane. 
So, almost by accident, the subject 1,450 horsepower R2000 proved to be an extremely reliable commercial and military success by any measure. Ironically, as we'll discuss in a later episode, Pratt & Whitney's very last piston engine, and also the very last heavy radial designed to see production, was the reintroduction of the old R2180 Twin Hornet 10 years later as the Twin Wasp E in 1949, using a highly refined and unconventional design based on Pratt & Whitney's very successful and widely used mega engine, the R4360 Wasp Major, with its unique cylinder design arrangement. The Twin Wasp E, like the R1830 and the R2000, featured a twin row 14 cylinder arrangement. However, compared to these earlier engines, the new R2180 with the same 5.75 by 6 inch bore and stroke as the original Twin Hornet of a decade earlier benefited from state of the art advancements such as forged rather than cast aluminum cylinder heads like the 28 cylinder R4360 among many other physical design changes. This allowed the new R2180 to develop 1,800 horsepower with performance number 115-145 Avgas, which represented almost 25% more power than the R2000 could develop, actually putting it out of the horsepower range for this discussion. The Twin Wasp E's interesting technical details such as the reversal of the R4360 cylinder intake and exhaust ports will be covered in more detail in a later higher horsepower episode. However, we mention it now because it was an evolutionary offshoot of the R1830 and R2000 family, so we at least want to make this connection to this unusual engine in this episode. But this updated R2180 was cursed just like the first one of a decade earlier. Once again, this was a limited production engine, this time due to the declining market in the face of the newly emerging jet age. However, this engine was used in a limited production European airliner, the obscure Saab 90 Scandia. Only 18 Scandias were produced, seen service from 1950 until 1969. The Scandinavian airline SAS flew all 18 until 1957, when all the planes were sold to the Brazilian carrier VASP, who flew them into the late 1960s. Accordingly, only around 60 Twin Wasp E's were built. The Scandia was an unsuccessful competitor in the class of short and medium range airliners, such as the Martin 202 and 404, and the Convair 240, 340, and 440 series, all powered by Pratt & Whitney R2800s, which will be covered in later episodes. So, back to our main story. The predominant application for the definitive R2000 was the four-engine Douglas DC-4, which had an Army designation of C-54. To simplify this narration and to calm down any of you purist viewers out there, from here on out, most of the time, I'll refer to both the commercial DC-4 and the military C-54 as simply the DC-4 as this was the original designation for its originally intended commercial service, even though it served with numerous militaries in even greater numbers. The revised DC-4 was 25% lighter than the 4E, and it was simpler, unpressurized, and had a straight wing versus the subtle sweep at the leading edge, as well as a more standard single vertical tail. Though starting with the R2000s developing 1,050 horsepower each, as mentioned, the power of subsequent versions gradually rose to the definitive 1,450 horsepower. Representative specifications for the definitive DC-4 with 1,450 horsepower R2000 2SD13G twin WASP D engines are as follows. Empty weight, 39,000 pounds. Maximum takeoff weight, 73,000 pounds. Maximum payload, 14,200 pounds. It could carry 86 passengers in high density layouts or 50 troops in canvas bucket seats, all roughly double the capacity of the DC-3. Wingspan was 117 feet, six inches. Cruise speed, 207 miles an hour at 10,000 feet. 
range was 1,150 miles with maximum payload or 2,180 miles with maximum fuel. Service ceiling was 22,300 feet. Douglas built 80 commercial DC-4 1009s and 1,163 C-54s. They were initially built in Santa Monica, California, but most production was in Chicago, Illinois. The redesigned DC-4 first flew in 1942 and was the first production large U.S. transport to use tricycle landing gear rather than a tailwheel. However, just like with the DC-3, the DC-4 production was commandeered by the U.S. Army Air Force for wartime troop carrying and cargo service. While it did not see the C-47's frontline D-Day-like combat, it made tens of thousands of wartime transatlantic and transpacific crossings during the war with an impeccable safety record. In truth, the DC-4 represented the definitive size blueprint for further single-aisle land plane airliners to this day. An immediate post-war military role that the World War II era DC-4 was well known for was the Berlin Airlift of 1948 and 1949. After the war, those 80 pure civilian DC-4 1009s were produced, in addition to hundreds of existing C-54 conversions to DC-4 stopgap commercial airliners. Starting in October 1945, examples of the first airlines to put the plane in service included American Overseas and Pan American, and European airlines such as KLM, Sabina, Swissair, and in other parts of the world, Australian National and South African Airways. Name legacy U.S. airlines later putting the DC-4 into service included United, Delta, Northwest, National, American, and TWA. We're not going into a complete history of the DC-4 with the airlines, but we will mention that their flagship status with the majors was short-lived, being quickly superseded by the more advanced pressurized Douglas DC-6 and Lockheed Constellations during the early 1950s, which got off to a slightly slow start due to the sheer numbers of cheap available surplus DC-4s. The DC-4 also served in freighter, medevac, personnel and other specialty applications with the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy Reserves all the way until the early 1970s, long after the major airlines got rid of them, and as well with non-U.S. militaries for at least a decade or two after that. Less than a handful of DC-4s remain in revenue or air show display service today, with one or two of the very last commercial revenue freight operations now occurring in Alaska as of the date of this video. And at least one is a flying air show display with the Berlin Airlift Historical Foundation. radical derivative of the Douglas DC-4 was designed and built in Canada under license from Douglas was the Canadair DC-4M Northstar, also known as the Argonaut, in the UK. 
This transport aircraft was initially specified during World War II by TransCanada Airlines and the Royal Canadian Air Force and first flew in 1946. Unlike the DC-4, the DC-4M was pressurized and utilized more advanced DC-6 components except for the unique engine choice as we shall see. It served mostly as a long-range airliner, but also served in both personnel and freight service with the Royal Canadian Air Force. Perhaps its most recognizable difference from the standard DC-4 was that the DC-4M utilized a V-12 engine rather than a radial engine. More specifically, it employed a higher-powered version of the Rolls-Royce V-1650 Merlin that was best known as the power plant for two of the most well-known World War II fighter planes, the North American P-51 Mustang that used a license-built U.S. Packard version of the Merlin and the Supermarine Spitfire that used Rolls-Royce-built Merlins. It also powered other well-known World War II British combat aircraft such as the earlier Hawker Hurricane single-engine fighter of the Battle of Britain fame and the four-engine Avro Lancaster heavy bomber and the twin-engine de Havilland Mosquito fighters in ground attack aircraft. The V-1650 Merlin was a water-cooled V-12 with each cylinder having a boron stroke of 5.4 by 6.0 inches resulting in a total displacement of 1,649 cubic inches. This is a crude model of the post-war transport version of the Merlin used in the DC-4M North Star that like the later World War II fighters, had a two-stage gear-driven supercharger with a large intercooler. In the North Star, each Merlin developed 1,760 horsepower in the 626 variant of the engine, which was a higher horsepower rating than most that were utilized in the earlier fighter applications. Most of the Merlin fighter engine horsepower ratings were lower, closer to that of the 1,450 horsepower R2000 twin Wasp D. Though the transport engine was of higher horsepower that should fall into our next episode, we cover it now because the North Star was such a close part of the DC-4 evolution, so to speak. First flown in July 1946, the three principal Canadian users of the DC-4M North Star were TransCanada Airlines, Canadian Pacific Airlines, and the Royal Canadian Air Force. As we previously alluded to, the DC-4M had better all-around performance than the stock R2000-powered DC-4, including a cruise speed that was 60 to 80 miles an hour faster. However, passengers found the cabin extremely noisy compared to its radial engine-powered counterparts. To reduce noise somewhat, most of the Argonaut variants flying out of the UK had redesigned exhaust systems using crossover tubes that dumped all exhaust to the outboard side of each engine nacelle away from the passengers. While most versions of the DC-4M utilized three-blade propellers, We'd like to point out that TransCanada specified that its DC-4M-2-4 versions use four-blade propellers. British Argonaut operators included British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC, and later secondary operators such as British Midland, Derby Airways, and Air Lynx, and other operators in the Mideast and Africa included Aden Airways and East African Airways. All these second-tier airlines flew Argonauts well into the 1960s when mainline operations quickly dwindled to a trickle while the Royal Canadian Air Force retired all theirs in 1965. A handful of DC-4Ms operated into the early 1970s with so-called mom-and-pop operators. The last North Star in airline service was a freighter flown by Turks Air LTD out of Sarasota, Florida. 
It was retired in Fort Lauderdale and scrapped in 1976. The last DC-4M in specialized service was with Canada's National Research Council, which was retired that same year as a geographical survey aircraft. It retained Royal Canadian Air Force colors to the very end. Another unique derivative of the DC-4 was the Aviation Traders ATL-98 Carver, which retained the same 1,450 horsepower R2000s. Only 21 Carvers were built in the early 1960s, and they almost looked like 747s with propellers. All Carvers were manufactured in the UK. A more accurate word is remanufactured. The brainchild of engineer and airline mogul Sir Freddie Laker, the Carver was the result of major DC-4 modifications that included a raised flight deck, lengthened fuselage, and an enlarged squared-off tail that looked similar to that of the DC-7C. The forward fuselage bulged with an upper level that housed the flight deck just like the Boeing 747. This allowed the full length of the fuselage as cargo capacity and for a large nose entry cargo door that allowed direct frontal loading of oversized cargo, but retained the side loading cargo doors found with the DC-4. Standard DC-4s and other prop liners could not do this because of their awkward side loading doors. Laker designed the Carver to ferry automobiles over the English Channel with greater ease with their drivers and passengers seated in the rear fuselage behind the cars. British Air Ferries, or BAF, was the largest initial operator of the Carver, but the ferry operations always lost money and the Carvers actually spent most of their decades with second-hand users in ad hoc cargo service all over the world because of their versatile cargo capacities. Compared to the standard DC-4, Carver payload weight capacity was minimally impacted for increased payload volume capacity at a slight 5 to 10 mile per hour cruise speed penalty. Less than a handful of Carvers were operating past the year 2000 with the last flight occurring in August 2005 between Rantoul, Illinois and Sherman Grayson County Airport in Texas as operated by Gator Global after uplifting a group of skydivers at the old Chanute Air Force Base. I personally saw the last of this type on that final round trip as it winged over St. Louis at around 5,000 feet on Airway Victor 88 right overhead toward its Rantoul, Illinois skydiving mission on August 6, 2005, while my wife and I were eating lunch on the patio of one of our favorite restaurants. Mind you, this was in 2005 in the middle of the continental United States, out of nowhere. By that time, I'd thought the Carver had long since made its very last flight, so I couldn't believe my eyes and ears. This was like running into a live Tyrannosaurus Rex in the woods. And finally, we now have our other noteworthy R2000 powered aircraft besides the DC-4. It was a latecomer as far as heavy piston radial power is concerned. The twin-engine de Havilland Canada DHC-4 Caribou was developed during the latter half of the 1950s, largely in conjunction with the U.S. Army specifications for a short takeoff and landing, or STOL, tactical combat transport for combat assaults. In this role, the Army designated the plane as the C-7. The specifications called for a plane that could operate out of smaller, unimproved forward combat airstrips compared to the larger Fairchild C-123s and Lockheed C-130 Hercules. Despite its smaller size than the standard technical transports, this would become de Havilland Canada's largest aircraft development to date, following the footsteps of its much smaller single-engine high-wing DHC-2 Beaver and DHC-3 Otter, both of which were also in use by the U.S. Army. 
slightly larger than a Douglas DC-3 or C-47, the C-7 Caribou had a wingspan of 95 feet 7 inches and could carry a maximum payload of 8,700 pounds, or around 30 passengers or troops, or 26 paratroopers, or 22 stretcher cases. As far as freight goes, it could carry up to two light vehicles. All loading was through the single rear near ground level door ramp similar to the C-123 and C-130. This arrangement facilitated rapid loading and unloading on the ground and provided for uncomplicated straight out airdrops of cargoes and paratroopers. Maximum takeoff weight was 28,500 pounds and cruise speed was 182 miles an hour at 7,500 feet with a maximum fuel range of around 1,300 miles or a maximum payload range of 240 miles. Service ceiling was about 25,000 feet. The Caribou was powered by two 1,450 horsepower R2000 7M2 Twin Wasp D engines with a single stage, two speed internal geared supercharger, which was typical for transport radial engines. Like the twin Convair liner 240, 340, and 440 series of short to medium range airliners, the engine exhaust was routed into two large diameter overwing exhaust augmenter tubes. Through Venturi effect, these tubes increased exhaust gas velocity, creating incremental additional so-called jet thrust. The first Caribou flight was in July 1958, and initial deliveries to the U.S. Army commenced in January 1961, which was clearly a very late initial in-service date for an aircraft powered by heavy piston radial engines. Though only one other heavy piston aircraft entered service a few years later. That will be discussed in a later episode covering the more powerful Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp. That said, the Army ultimately took 159 Caribou deliveries in the early 1960s. The Caribou was most widely known for its service in the Vietnam War. The U.S. Army first deployed them there in 1965, again to supplement the U.S. Air Force's Fairchild C-123s and Lockheed C-130 Hercules in the assault transport role, particularly in tighter forward combat airfields to supply special forces. However, in 1967, after lengthy infighting among the armed services, the Army handed over all of its caribous to the U.S. Air Force, winning the battle to handle all fixed-wing tactical airlift to better coordinate with its other two larger tactical transports. In Southeast Asia, some caribous were allocated for a quasi-civilian capacity, notably with the CIA's Air America, which was nonetheless closely tied to the U.S. Air Force. Later in the war, many of the Air Force's caribous were turned over to the South Vietnamese Air Force as part of the U.S. policy of gradual Vietnamization, or fully turning over the prosecution of the war against North Vietnam and the Viet Cong communists to the South Vietnamese. With the final fall of the South in 1975, a few caribous were taken over and operated by the communists during their integration and indoctrination of the South. There were ultimately 307 caribous manufactured, meaning that the U.S. Army was not the only initial customer. Other military customers included the Royal Canadian and Australian Air Forces, and quite a few new and hand-me-downs went to the Air Forces of several other countries, including those of Spain, India, Malaysia, Ghana, Cameroon, Kenya, and many others. After the Vietnam War, U.S. Air Force caribous were handed over to the U.S. Air Force Reserves and Air National Guards, who operated them well into the 1980s. For several years, the U.S. Army retained a couple of caribous for its Golden Knights parachute demonstration team. The last of these was retired and replaced in 1985 with a twin turboprop Fokker F-27. Beyond that, a few lingering caribou examples found their way into the civilian freight and overnight package markets worldwide, but these were mostly secondhand, very used, and otherwise near run-out aircraft. 
Caribous were therefore not very successful in their commercial roles. The Royal Australian Air Force retired the last military DHC-4 Caribou in frontline service in 2009, quite late indeed. That's about all we have to frame up the very successful and reliable Pratt & Whitney R2000 Twin Wasp D, which saw both military and commercial revenue service from 1942 until at least 2015 and possibly beyond. And of course, at least one caribou either is or was recently still plying the airshow circuit as well, along with the BAHF C-54. So thanks for spending your valuable time with us today, and we'll see you again in our next episode 5, which will cover a slightly more powerful radial than the R2000, the highly refined 9 series versions of the Curtis Wright R1820 engine developing up to 1,525 horsepower in military aircraft such as the S2F Tracker and E1 Tracer the North American T-28 Trojan and Sikorsky S-58 and H-34 Choctaw helicopter. You will also see that the Advanced 9 Series R-1820 was not widely used in transport aircraft. However, there are two notable exceptions. Chicago and Southern Airlines took delivery of five DC-4s that were STC modified with 1,425 horsepower 9 series R1820s, a DC-4 version that eludes most of us. Also, an improved stretch conversion of the DC-3 called the Super DC-3 was powered by the 1,475 horsepower version of this engine. The Super DC-3 and its C-117 military variant saw a respectable production run, though it was not widely accepted by the airlines due to being overshadowed by other twins, such as the higher performance Martin and Convair short and medium range airliners. But the US Navy and Marines took up most of the slack for Douglas. As a logical extension, we'll also cover the little-known Little Brother direct offshoot of the 9 Series R1820, the 7-cylinder R1300 of 800 horsepower that also powered a less robust version of the T-28, as well as the Sikorsky S-55 and H-19 helicopter. This downsizing of a larger engine follows the footsteps of another engine, the Pratt & Whitney R1340 Wasp, whose downsized derivative was the R985 Wasp Jr., which was discussed in Episode 1 of this Poor Man's Hangar Tour series. As with all advanced 9 series R1820s and all US built late model post-war heavy radials, you'll see that the little R1300 also used the state-of-the-art radial engine metallurgy, cylinder bore, and technology of the big post-war Curtis Wright radials, including the R3350. So, as we always say, stay tuned.